When one thinks of a catastrophic tragedy occurring at sea, the Titanic is most often the first disaster that springs to mind. Though the events which took place on that fateful voyage are still discussed to this very day and popularized in television and film adaptations, the SS Sultana is one that is often overlooked, a maritime disaster that was equally shocking and suffered more casualties. In this episode, we will investigate exactly what caused the SS Sultana to burst into flames on the 27th of April 1865, as it traveled down the Mississippi River. What was the steamboat's purpose during those weeks that followed the end of the American Civil War? What caused it to perish, and who was responsible for such a cataclysmic event, and resulted in the death of 1,195 passengers and crew members? Join us on this episode of Maritime Mishaps, as we travel back to 1865 to understand and discuss the deadliest maritime disaster in US history, the SS Sultana. The Boat In order to appreciate the scale of both the boat itself, as well as the immense loss of life, which was reported after its destruction, we must go back even further to its construction, purpose and movements across the southern states of America. The SS Sultana was a privately owned sidewheel steamboat built in February 1863 in the architectural city of Cincinnati, Ohio, and acquired by its original owner, a steamboat captain named Preston Lodwick. Lodwick had a history of owning and facilitating steamboats for a living. During the Civil War, one of his boats, named Prince of Wales, was captured by the Confederates and set alight on the Yazoo River. This would not deter the captain from using the riverways. However, it would subsequently force him to serve with the Confederate Army after another one of his boats was lost on the Mississippi River in 1862. Lodwick would eventually escape back to the north and captain more vessels before being issued with the Sultana. Standing three decks tall, measuring 260 feet in length and 70 feet wide, the steamboat was eventually sold by Lodwick in the spring of 1864 to a consortium that included 34-year-old Captain James Cass Mason. The Sultana's purpose was to operate within the New Orleans cotton trade, carrying manufactured goods and civilian passengers between the Louisiana city and the port of St. Louis, Missouri. In April 1865, Captain Mason made the fastest known trip upriver, steering the Sultana to great success and recognition, and awarded various contracts for its impressive feats. Before the Disaster before the Sultana burst into flames, killing the majority of those on board, she made a quick stop in Vicksburg. Situated in Warren County, Mississippi, where Captain Mason struck up a conversation with the chief quartermaster of the region at that time, Captain Reuben Benton Hatch. Both men discussed various topics and job offers, then Hatch made an offer that Mason could not refuse. As the Civil War had just ended, with the surrender of General Robert E. Lee, it was noted that approximately 5,000 paroled Union soldiers were being released and allowed to go home after being held captive by the Confederate Army. The men were stationed at Andersonville in Georgia, as well as Cahaba, Alabama, and it was known that various steamboats were transporting the soldiers back to their families, with the government paying a high price for anyone interested in taking up the contract. During their discussions, Hatch suggested that Mason could facilitate the Sultana to carry a minimum of 1,000 men upriver, a journey allowing him to pocket approximately $2,500, and would be given the job if Mason gave him a share of the spoils. Mason would agree to the job, despite both men knowing that the boat would be extremely overcrowded due to its maximum capacity being held for 376 passengers and 85 crew members. On April 23, 1865, the vessel docked again in Vicksburg, however she had an issue with one of the four boilers, a leak that needed repairing before she could set off again. Noticing that the soldiers were beginning to arrive, Mason was surprised to find that nearly 2,000 men showed up, desperate to go home. Union Army Captain George Williams was tasked with overseeing the logistics of boarding his soldiers from hospitals and camps onto steamboats, fully aware that many smaller boats were accepting bribes and offers to carry them too. Time constraints, legalities, and pressure from his superiors forced Williams to usher the men onto the Sultana, a rushed job that coincided with the repair works being carried out on the damaged boiler. 
Sensing an opportunity to make even more money from the chaos, Captain Mason decided to halt the repair job and ordered the mechanics to patch up the damage, as opposed to finalizing their initial task. Ignoring the dangers of cramming all of the soldiers into the steamboat for a single journey, the result meant that the Sultana was now carrying more than five times its legal capacity. She would set off on her ill-fated journey from Vicksburg Wharf on the evening of April 24, 1865, with a final count of 2,137 passengers, 1,960 were ex-prisoners, with the remainder consisting of 22 guards, 85 crew members, and 70 paying passengers. The Disaster With the overcrowding sparking major issues from the start, Captain Mason had to manage the constant shuffling and movement of the freight and soldiers on board as well as continuously checking the damaged boiler in the hope that it would not deplete. After a stop in Helena, Arkansas, the Sultana reached Memphis, where 300,000 pounds of sugar was offloaded and replaced with a massive load of coal. After reloading, the steamboat set sail in the early morning of April 27th towards its destination of Cairo, Illinois, where the soldiers would disperse. Not long after the Sultana departed Memphis, around 2 a.m., disaster struck. Without any warning, three of the four boilers ignited from their upper back and exploded simultaneously, tearing through the center of the boat structure. The eruption shot through the Sultana at a 45 degree angle through the main cabin and crew quarters and ripped apart two thirds of the pilot house. As the blast came from the boilers themselves, as opposed to the furnace fireboxes, the giant smokestacks gave way and collapsed onto the barge with the right smokestack smashing into the center of the Sultana. The second smokestack tore through the hurricane deck, which held many of the passengers and crew, as well as the crowded second deck underneath, killing hundreds on impact. Panic, confusion and desperation ensued as the upper decking collided with the lower sections of the boat, eventually causing the middle section to burst into flames. Those who survived the initial explosion and had not been thrown into the waters below attempted to extinguish the blaze using buckets. However, their attempts were in vain, as the majority of the canisters were nowhere to be found. Another key component to the engulfment of the Sultana was the weather. Though the water below was freezing cold, the wind began to cause havoc with the bow. Originally pointing towards the wind direction, the position of the bow provided a short window of time for the passengers to try and find a way out. However, when the paddle wheel boxes broke away from the boat, the Sultana turned in the opposite direction. At this point, the bow was pointing downstream and the fire immediately turned back towards those who waited within its vicinity. The passengers were now stuck and face to face with the oncoming blaze. Minutes after the Sultana erupted into flames, the Bostona No. 2 steamboat arrived on the scene whilst traveling downriver. They began to throw planks, chairs, doors, and anything else that could be used as a floating raft to the screaming men and women in the water. After Captain Watson from the Bostona realized the severity of the damage, he decided to head down river to raise the alarm and plea for help amongst his fellow seamen. Meanwhile, back at Memphis docks, those who were working on the station steamboats gradually became aware of what was happening to the Sultana. One obvious indication was the dead bodies that were floating back towards the wharf. Only a few of those souls were still alive and crying out for help. A fleet of smaller steamboats was dispatched in an attempt to rescue those in the river, whilst the larger steamboats were being prepped to take to the waters in a desperate search and rescue mission. Approximately 150 people were rescued onto the Boston and number two. Second attempts were useless as many of the passengers had already perished. On the other side of the river, hundreds of men and women had reached temporary safety in nearby rooftops, trees and barnyards, which had previously been flooded. Around 7 a.m., the Sultana drifted towards another set of flooded treetops, lodging in Hen Island, located above Mound City in Arkansas, which was under Confederate control during the Civil War. From there, a group of courageous survivors boarded the doomed steamboat once more in the hope of rescuing more people. Archived newspaper articles suggest that local resident John Fogelman, an ancestor of the city of Marion's former mayor, he and his sons had spotted the Sultana which was still ablaze after the remains of the paddle wheels drifted downriver, and so decided to help. The Fogelmans did not have any boats that could reach the trapped soldiers, 
so they had to use makeshift materials to assist those in desperate need. I understand that the Fogelmans were able to put together some logs to make a raft and go out and take people off the boat as it drifted back this way, Frank Fogelman stated. In order to save time, they would set the people off in treetops and go back to the boat to take more off. The improvised mission helped save many. However, it wasn't long after that, the SS Sultana began to sink into the Mississippi River. Death and Destruction It is recorded that 786 people, in total, were rescued from the steamboat disaster and were immediately rushed to hospitals and neighbouring medical barracks with an extensive list of injuries, most especially exposure and exhaustion from the icy cold water. After the final count was made of those rescued, the heartbreaking news was revealed that all of the children who were on board the Sultana had died, and that only five of the 50 women survived the catastrophic event. Of the 786 people rescued, 31 died after being admitted to the hospital clinics, with three civilians being buried in Elmwood City Cemetery. The remaining corpses were of soldiers, who were transported to Fort Pickering Cemetery, just south of the city, to be laid to rest. The surviving Confederate prisoners were separated into three groups, and were shipped off to Camp Chase, in Ohio, to be granted freedom to return to their families. Due to the colossal death toll, the city of Memphis very quickly ran out of pine coffins to lay the bodies of the dead, and had to resort to basic blankets and cloths. However, it is noted that most of the bodies were never recovered, and most likely sunk or floated downriver, many of which were spotted by local residents of towns and villages. Captain James Mason, who took the deal from Captain Hatch to overcrowd the steamboat, also lost his life in the disaster, with the final count being declared as 1,169 deaths, and with only 963 survivors. Lessons Learned As with any unforeseen disaster, the United States government launched an investigation into the SS Sultana's demise, and who was responsible for the overcrowding, mismanagement, and overseeing of safety precautions before setting sail. Any and all possibilities of deliberate tampering with the mechanics and or treachery amongst the captain and his crew were quickly dismissed. Despite the personal gains predicted by Captain Mason's wager with Reuben Hatch, it was officially concluded that the cause of the steamboat bursting into flames and subsequently sinking was down to the deficiencies in the boilers which resulted in too much steam pressure and not enough water being contained within them. A thorough examination was conducted on the remaining boiler that was salvaged from the wreckage. The conclusion was reiterated, as it was said to contain scorch marks on its interior, indicating that the Sultana was indeed running with water shortages. So was anyone ever held accountable? Interestingly, another person responsible for overseeing the boarding of the passengers at the origin port and parole camp, Captain Frederick Speed, was found guilty for the negligent overcrowding of passengers onto the SS Sultana after being put on trial in January 1886. However, despite being convicted, Captain Speed was subsequently granted freedom, and his sentence was overturned after the Judge Advocate General of the Army reviewed his case and blamed Captain Hatch for the congestion within the boat. Authorities attempted to summon Hatch after issuing three subpoenas against his name, all of which were ignored by the captain and would fail in their attempts at locating his whereabouts after a US Marshal was sent to arrest him. With Captain Speed being absolved of any wrongdoing, Captain Mason dying at the scene, and Captain Hatch's disappearance, no one was ever arrested, convicted, or held responsible for the deaths of those on board the SS Sultana. The Aftermath Unfortunately, unlike the Titanic, the tragedy that befell the SS Sultana was overshadowed by events occurring in America at the end of the Civil War. General Robert E. Lee had surrendered, Abraham Lincoln had just been assassinated, and his killer, John Wilkes Booth, had been tracked down and shot the day before the events on the Mississippi River. So what exactly happened to the structure of the boat? After the flames died out and the SS Sultana sunk into the depths of the Mississippi, it remained dormant for a while due to the weight of the sand and mud which covered its frame, thus burying it deep underwater. At the turn of the season, the rivers changed direction and pushed the steamboat remnants towards the east. They were eventually dumped under a soybean field in Arkansas, 
approximately two miles from where it capsized. It was officially located in 1982 by Jerry O. Potter, an attorney and historian, whose 1997 book, The Sultana Tragedy, America's Greatest Maritime Disaster, details the events as they unfolded and discusses the aftermath in detail. Unable to resurrect the doomed steamboat from the site in Arkansas, the SS Sultana remains buried under the field to this very day and is a constant reminder of what happened that morning in 1865. Conclusion Preliminary checks and assurances for the safe handling of aircraft, machines, boats and other mechanics are generally considered mandatory for most aviation, maritime and industrialized companies. Lawsuits, deaths and social media have solidified the necessity for such preventative measures to reduce the risk of another disaster like the Titanic, the Deepwater Horizon tragedy and indeed the SS Sultana from ever happening again. For those who survived the ordeal, a pact was made, and it was agreed that they would meet in Knoxville in April of each year until only one of them was left. The final survivor showed up alone in 1930 in honor of his fellow veterans. On July 4th, 1916, a group of survivors dedicated an impressive monument made of pink Tennessee marble in the Mount Olive Baptist Church Cemetery in Stokes County, North Carolina. In 1987, Knoxville attorney Norman Shaw started the Association of Sultana Descendants and Friends Group. Those who joined would also meet annually in Knoxville and continue the tradition to this day. Other monuments have been built out of respect for the Sultana in Cincinnati, Memphis, Vicksburg, and other cities and ports. It is hard to comprehend the fear, desperation, and horror that befell those who boarded the SS Sultana, and one can only imagine what they went through. It is however especially fitting to know that a museum was built in 2015 to mark the 150th anniversary of the disaster and to remind everyone never to forget the men, women and children who perished that day. Thank you for watching this episode of Maritime Mishaps. Don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our weekly videos. Next week we'll be talking about the USS Johnston, which is the deepest shipwreck ever found. Take care.